Let's take a look at a specific aspect of Abrahamic traditions, the promise of an afterlife, and see how it relates to the philosophic calculus. In particular, we want to look at the hypothetical consequentialist calculus of a religious believer, who is convinced that heaven and hell exist and they are eternal, as professed by Christianity and Islam, the two most popular religions. We will also assume that the believer accepts that a mortal sin could land him in hell. In other words, there is a chance he could end up in an existence of endless suffering if he doesn't behave according to the tenets of his religion. For example, take a believer who got lost in a desert with his family and after a tiresome journey reached a known lonely hut with some water and food inside, but no owner present. The hut is many hours of walking from the home of a family, and the believer is quite certain that if they do not drink some water and eat some of the food lying in the hut, him and his family will not make it back home. On the other hand, the believer also knows that the owner of the lonely hut hates him and would never want him to drink his water and eat his food. What ought he do? Would it be a good action for the believer to take some water and some food, effectively stealing? to save himself and his family. Well, let's do the eudaimonic calculus. Eating the food and drinking the water, his family would probably be spared from dying. And under some mild assumptions, this would quite straightforwardly eclipse the suffering experienced by the owner of the hut, when he will discover what transpired. But there is another part of the eudaimonic calculations to consider, the rule erosion component. In fact, by eating the food and drinking the water, the believer's family could be seen as eroding the rule to not steal. How does this ulterior consequence of the action of eating the food and drinking the water change the calculations? We will answer this question from two different ideological standpoints. First, from the perspective of a standard atheist, and then from the perspective of an extremely devout believer who is convinced of the existence of the afterlife. Taking a purely utilitarian approach to the case at hand by a non-believer, the value to assign to the rule erosion component would depend on many variables. The time period, the average food supplies people could afford, and so on and so forth. The rule erosion component could also be non-existent, like in the case of Italy, where stealing food for hunger was recently ruled to not be a crime. One could even argue that if it was a prohibition to steal by law in such a case, eroding it by breaking it would be a good consequence, implying a positive rule erosion component in our calculations. Without getting bogged down in too many details, there are good reasons to believe that in the great majority of cases, the rule erosion component would not change the resulting sign of our computations. In such cases, the utilitarian calculus would tell us that eating the food and drinking the water would be a good action. Great. Now let's turn to the perspective of an extremist believer. For a hardline believer, breaking the divine rule to not steal, depending on his ideological inclinations and the historical period, could be a mortal sin, that has a chance to land himself and his family in hell, if say they die before a chance to repent themselves. Thus, if a believer engaged in the consequentialist calculus, all the components would be the same, except the rule erosion one. For him, breaking the rule to not steal would represent a chance at eternal suffering. We can translate this fact in the computations as the rule erosion component having value minus infinity. So, in a consequentialist framework with a chance of burning forever in the pits of hell, drinking the water and eating the food would not be a good action. Rather than breaking a god-given law, a devout believer ought to try his meagre chances at getting back home. Because of his faith in the afterlife, the eudaimonic calculus would tell him that in any case, breaking the divine law is wrong. With respect to the first instance we looked at, the results on whether an action is good or bad are skewed in the direction of rule following. Okay, now why did we perform this strange exercise of applying a consequentialist framework to a person that gets his morals from a deontological source? Well, firstly, the example given, hopefully, showcases how absurd religion extremism can be. To drive a point further home, one can imagine a fanatic that believes that committing a terrorist attack would make him a martyr of God and land him in heaven. 
The eudaimonic calculus of he who holds such a belief would be skewed in a similar manner as before towards committing the attack, since heaven represents an infinite source of happiness. So the baseless belief in an afterlife may encourage one to commit some highly dubious actions. This effect can plausibly seep into the choices of even religious moderates, albeit more subtly. Indeed, multiple studies find that religious individuals are more likely to evaluate various behaviours according to whether they comport with certain rules of action, rather than in terms of their costs or benefits. Secondly, it's interesting to note how religion invented the afterlife in such a way to compel the believers to obey the norms. The hell heaven afterlife is designed so that if one believes in it, it aligns the consequentialist moral reasoning with the deontological religious one. If you follow the tenets of religion, the ultimate consequence of your actions will give you infinite happiness after you perish. At the same time, the promise of possible endless suffering for disobedience makes religion the perfectly warped instrument to compel the following of the rules even for people who could be inclined to think consequentially. The afterlife idea is also not exclusive to Abrahamic religions. Even many schools of Dharmic religion professed that good intent and good deeds contributed to happier rebirths, employing the notion of karma. From a theoretical standpoint, the way in which the construct of the afterlife is created to match the deontological and consequentialist answer to moral questions is highly ingenious. It could be a reason for the lasting success of some of the major religions. And for us, it could even provide some evidence for the intrinsic importance of utilitarianism in human moral reasoning. The consequentialist approach could not be completely disregarded in the creation of a practical deontological moral system, but had to be ultimately accounted for with the idea of life after death. Neat. Notice that even though in this channel we have previously reflected on how the creation of religion itself could have ultimately been a consequentialist endeavour, and possibly a positive one given that it might have been necessary to develop it to get some form of human civilization up and running, our criticism of its theoretical deontological elements is perfectly in line with our broader consequentialist views. As a cultural norm, religion could be dawning on its usefulness. A gradual abandonment of a pernicious dogmatic rule following aspects of religion could very well be a positive route for humanity moving forward. The process appears to be already underway. But we must be careful what we let substitute in as our new collective moral compass, and to which entities we leave this responsibility. In this channel, of course, we believe we have identified a suitable replacement, but the details on how the passing of a torch could occur are complex and rarely discussed despite their importance. They could make for an interesting subject for another video.